Well, joining me on this occasion on rockpro.com is vocalist Jamie Brown from American band Roxanne back with a brand new album. Welcome to rockpro.com. Thanks for having me. Well, it's got to say, uh, the album is out in a week's time. Of course, it's Radio Silence out on Rat Pack Records. Um, I guess the uh, the first question is going to be, what took you so long? <laughs> um, what took us so long? A good question. You know, we, um, after the first record came out, uh, we, you know, there was kind of an uphill battle with what was happening in the record industry and our label in particular, so... Uh, we decided to take a different route to make a room. We thought for a short period, that period turned out to be about 25 years. Um, so, you know, we've, we've been busy doing music, just not doing original music. Right. And uh, then uh, Rat Pack gave us the opportunity, and we said, sure, we took it. So now we're back. I've got to say, it was a very pleasant surprise when um, I saw the announcement from Rat Pack that... Um, uh, second album was come out for you guys. Uh, had the first album well since since the day it was released, uh, and always loved it. So um, it's just great to have you guys back. It has to say. Obviously, the first album came out way back in nineteen eighty eight. We uh, do you still miss those days? Because I certainly do. Do, do. What was do I miss those days? Yeah. Was that the question? It was um, indeed. Uh, yeah, you know, I I, I miss being uh, that age and that crazy and the crazy <laughs> times that we had. But you know, I'm I'm enjoying things as they are now too. So uh, I, I like I'm enjoying both. One thing that uh, intrigued me, um, reading obviously the PR notes that uh, came through at the end, was the fact that uh, you recorded this album in analog. Um, what was the decision behind that? Was that simply because you preferred the sound of it? I know um, as a sort of Purist is probably the wrong word, but I mean, you, I can normally tell if it's an analog recording, but I'm interested to see what uh, your sort of outlook was on that. Well, um, you know, the first record was analog because that was basically the only option of course. at that time. And, um, and then since then, the industry changed and uh, recording changed and everybody was going digital and there's definitely a lot of advantages to that. And then when it came time to do this, Things had kind of cycled back around, you know, vinyl had disappeared, but then it was coming back. And, um, you know, we're all old guys and kind of audio files, and we had the conversation, and, and the studio had both. So we kind of did a hybrid. We, um, we did the basic tracks on two-inch analog, so we could get the tape compression that we were looking for. Right. And then put that all into Pro Tools so we could manipulate it and move it around and arrange it the way we wanted to. Then we went back and then mixed back through an analog tape deck so we could finish it that way as well. So was there a separate mix and, uh, done for... Just... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. We have, we have a delay. Go ahead. So uh, was there um, uh, a different mix done for the vinyl release for this album? Because there is an awful trend by um, some labels to... Uh, I hate to say it, actually press their vinyl from MP3s. Oh, no, no, we didn't We didn't do that. We did a separate master for the vinyl. Um, that's different for the master for the CD. And there's a separate master for the MP3s versus the WAV file. So we tried to be careful with all of it so we could uh, maintain the fidelity all the way through. I notice also that uh, you were involved in the production of this album. I've got to say, the, the production, it just sounds um, a very sort of big, spacious album, if that makes sense, uh, but with an awful lot of clarity, because there's an awful... I mean, obviously, we all know the uh, the loud wars, etc., and there's an awful lot of compression and uh, and shoutiness on albums, but this has got quite a refreshing sound to it. Yeah, we did try to maintain that dynamic range. You know, if you push everything to the top, which is also a great sound, um, you know, that, that's it. Um, there's nothing else you, you can do. But we, we try to allow this record to breathe, and intentionally so. So you may have to turn your... It, it's mastered a little bit quieter, so you can turn your stereo up a little bit louder, but you can do that without... Uh, squashing it and and getting it all distorted. You can turn it up really loud and it's still nice and clean. Yeah, no. and that was that was intentional. Trust and, me, uh, I have turned this up loud. <laughs> a, spa 
a spacious sounding record. Um, the studio that we used, I think the ceiling in the main room where we did the, the, the drums and the guitar amps and that, I think the ceiling was probably 35 or 40 feet high. So wow. it was a big room. Wow. That, yeah, I'm going to say, that's, that's, that's quite a large space to record in. It was a it was a great experience. I mean, it was kind of the best of both worlds for us because, you know, we're all used to analog and thinking linear and how you get from point A to point B. So that was that was the way we worked. But then Rich, the guy who produced the record, um, he understood both. So we we it was a big uh, learning curve for us. But now we understand both aspects of it and, and like the ability to use both. When the four of you got back in a studio, obviously under the Roxanne name, did you um, find that you sort of fell into it together as though you'd never sort of been apart uh, recording or playing as Roxanne, or did it take a little while to sort of find that groove again? Well, we never parted ways. We've been we've been playing together, doing something or another this entire time. Um, right. We've we've made a living playing music since the day we put out the Roxanne record. Um, so it was just a switching gears as far as what we're going to play now. But the writing came relatively, uh, e well, I'm not going to say easy, but it was comfortable because we all kind of knew the target. So we weren't going off in a bunch of weird directions and having to convince each other, to, hey, let's pull it back into here. We were all kind of focused on the same target. So that was uh, relatively easy. As I said in my review of the album, it's uh, classic sounding rock sound, yet you've managed to add a modern twist to it as well, which is um, something which, um, as a as a listener and as a fan, I guess was a, was quite a quite a sort of tricky approach. Yeah, um, yeah, but I mean, we you know, we're not uh, we're not anti uh, modern rock music at all. We try to look at the elements of modern rock music and what current bands were doing and find the parts of that that we thought, hey, that is, that is an improvement. And let's let's keep that in, in mind too, as well as, you know, what are our roots and what is our, our, our classic rock motivation. So that's probably why you, you can hear both of those things. And um, I mean, we're, we're really proud of the record. You're one of the only people that have actually heard it. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when it comes out Friday and what other people it will I, I mean you know you I guess as a band when you're releasing new material it's always um, there's a slight sort of worry element to how fans are going to take it um, I say I'm only speaking as a fan not as, a, as an expert in these things um, to me yeah. I certainly wasn't disappointed and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you on the phone it just it had so many elements of the of the original album um, as I said, but with, you know, brought up to date. And I, I just wasn't disappointed with it at all. Um, and it was just intriguing, actually, to see, obviously, the uh, the guys you had guesting on the album, um, obviously the uh, the KXM guys. How did they get involved? Uh, I've known Ray, the drummer. I'm sure they didn't know exactly now. I mean, 15 or 20 years, maybe? And um, we've been friends, and we've played in bands together, and he was also a Roxanne fan from way back. And um, then uh, when the KXM record came out, Ray suggested to Rat Pack that I do their music video background in that as well. Okay. So that's how I met Doug and George, and I was a, have always been a fan of both of those guys. And King's X is probably my favorite band on the planet to be honest. So um, I met them and wound up doing, I don't know, I think five uh, music videos for KXM and then probably four for Lynch Mob or maybe maybe more than that. I think George Lynch has, I've done more videos for George Lynch than any other individual person. So <laughs> with Lynch Mob and all the different projects that George plays in, yeah. um, we became friends uh, that way. So it seemed natural when you know we're going to do a Roxanne record, you guys want to guest appear, and everybody says absolutely. So um, I'm really happy that they did their contribution. Uh, can't be overstated. No, absolutely. 
Um, obviously, on in, the fact, th- in fact, there's the song that comes out on release day has Doug Pennick and I doing kind of a duet. It, are we recording this? <laughs> are you going to air this? Because you know the title of the song. I'm not sure if I can say it. No, you go ahead and say it. I know exactly which track. It's actually my favorite track on the album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, so Doug, Doug and I kind of do a duet on Go Fuck Yourself. And that was a lot of fun. And I'd actually done the song entirely myself. And I thought, man, and Doug had played bass on Man in the Moon. And I thought, how great would it be if Doug sang every other line with me and go fuck yourself? So I asked him and he came down and took care of it. And then I thought, oh, now i got to go redo my vocals after hearing Doug's part. <laughs> so... <laughs> Obviously, you mentioned there, Man in the Moon. Um, obviously, you know, most people will know that track as obviously being on the Scream album, the first Scream album. Did you um, deliberately plan to have um, a cover version on this album? Because, of course, famously you had a cover version, a successful cover version on the first album. Or did it just sort of one of those tracks that sort of seemed to fall into place? Well, this is this is the interesting part of that, and I don't know if it technically qualifies as a cover because I wrote that song. Yeah, I mean, this is that what. Song, funny enough, this is what I've heard, and yet when that, you look it up on the likes of Wikipedia, saying you're not mentioned. Oh, really? Yeah. I guess it depends where you where you look. Um, I guess so we need to do some editing uh, on there's that. Two, there's, yeah, there's two songs. Um, there's two songs on this record. There's eleven songs total. There's two songs on this record that were written back in 89 right. to go on Roxanne 2. That's Corner to Four and Man in the Moon. Okay. But since we didn't do it, and I, I had been playing in a band, kind of, you know, well, let's see what happens with um, Scott Travis and Bruce Bouillet and John Alderotti. And we wrote some songs together, and then I brought some songs in. Man in the Moon is one of the songs that I brought in. So... When Scott got the gig in Judas Priest, that was pretty much the end of that project. So mm. Scott left to go play in Priest. I went to go uh, to my cover band world, and um, then the, the Scream got John Karabi and Walt Woodward to join, and then they did a record, and they included on that record Man in the Moon and another song called I Don't Care. So um, that's where that, that comes from, but... Um, yeah, that's why it's on the record, because it was intended for Axel 2, and that's what Radio Silence is. I must admit, I was, uh, until after I read, uh, wrote the review, I was actually ignorant on the fact that you'd written that song. I mean, it is a fantastic song. Um, love that song, obviously, because I've always known it as a scream song, but... Um, uh, it's it's interesting to hear it from yourself that you were the guy behind it, and, and congratulations on what is a superb song. Thank you. And then if you notice, if you have Doug Tennant playing bass at the very end, after that big power chord, Doug plays a little bit of Out of the Silent Planet. Yeah, I, I did, did notice, notice that. that. Yeah, I did notice that. And of course, you being a King's X fan, as you said, you must be getting quite excited the fact that their new album's about to hit. Yeah. I went, well, you know, the King, their first King's X record came out, I believe, it came out in um, 87, and it was out of the silent planet. And yeah. we were just starting pre-production on the first Roxanne record. And I had never heard anybody, didn't understand, you know, about detuning. And I heard the King's X record. What are they doing? And Fred explained it to me and showed me, yeah, I tuned the guitar down like this. Oh, oh that's what it is. So um, we wrote Nothing to Lose to go on the Roxanne record as a result of hearing King's X out of the silent planet with everything to do. Wow. So... Yeah, so I'm like, oh, okay, we got to do something to D. And so we wrote Nothing to Lose to D. So now, 30 years later, I actually get Doug Panic on my record twice, and he plays a little bit of Outer Planet Planet on it. That's that's kind of the bookend to my uh, musical journey. It is indeed. One thing I wanted to ask you, um, obviously Rat Pack do all these uh, fantastic um, fan bundles, etc., and I noticed that on the Ultimate Fan Bundle, one of the things that comes with it is a remastered copy of the original album with bonus tracks. Is this something that you're going to release separately at some time? Um, it is something that has been available um, already for quite a while. Um, 
on CD Baby and a couple of other places. Um, but we we let those run out now. So so now the only place to get it will be through Rat Pack. And yes, the plan is to eventually put it out separately. Oh, well, that's good news indeed. Well, there, also I wanted to ask you, obviously regarding the original album, was that there were two versions of the original album. Um, the version I bought originally, and then probably I must be, I guess, five or six years ago, I saw something pop up on eBay, which was a Japanese release with a slightly different track uh, listing and a, and a different title. Why yeah. was that? Yeah, the um, Sky Brothers was the label that it was on in 88, and they were distributed through CBS, and CBS had a deal with Sony in Japan. So um, we did four songs for a movie soundtrack after that record had come out for a Japanese... It was a, it was a superhero that was uh, a cartoon, and they were making a live-action film. Right. And uh, we did four songs for that soundtrack. So then... Coney Canyon, I think, was the Japanese label at that time. They took those four songs that we had done for that movie, and they were kind of in demo form. We never actually we were kind of like, we demoed, what about these four? And they just used those demos for the movie. Um, they added those four and took some songs in the original record. <laughs> the second record. Yeah, it was a strange combination of how they did it, because obviously they, they took what is, pro- you, I say, probably to a lot of people, the best-known track of the first album, they removed that off that version. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, I, I see things pop up and people go, hey, look what I got on eBay, and I have no idea where they're <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'm going to ask you, obviously, um, on the releases album, are you planning to do any live dates at all, whether it be just be festivals or what have you? We would we would love to get out and do live dates, um, and you know it, we're no stranger to it. But, you know, in one form or another, we've been doing live dates for the last thirty years. So we would love to get out and do it. It's just a matter of uh, there being enough interest to make it worthwhile for everyone. Also, I mean, what, what's it like? I, I mean, the the rock scene certainly in the UK um, is having a bit of a sort of um, so we say. Um, upward trend at the moment with a lot of young new bands coming in which is pretty exciting I don't, the scene in america seems to my mind uh sort of a bit sort of uh, fractured etc it really seems to depend where you are in the country and a lot of places there just seems to be no sort of original live music or bands that managing to get gigs i don't know how you see it from your point of view I think you're accurate with that. I mean, I don't know a lot about what's happening in the UK, but from little articles I've read and things I've seen online, it definitely looks like there is more of a uh, an upswing in new rock bands and people being interested in that. And in the States, it's just in pockets. Certain cities, um, people are interested, but for the most part, uh, it's, it's fractured and there isn't... Um, it's it's a it's a scattered map of finding those places right. where people are interested in new aspects. Yeah, that's pretty depressing considering you know America's always thought of as being sort of you know the land of music, so to speak. Yeah, it is. It, it is. Um, yeah, who, who knows? You know, trends come and go. Of course, things seem to cycle. Um, I mean, they cycle really fast on the east and the west coast. You know, people are interested in something and then they move on to something. And as you get more into the middle of the country, those trends don't cycle through so quickly. Um, you know, maybe it's more middle America is where you're going to have interest in the rock stuff and not so much on the, the two coasts. Of course, an obvious choice would be um, to get yourselves on the Monster Rock Cruise, maybe. Ha! Huh. Imagine that. That would be fun. Um, yeah, we, we would love to do it. Just, uh, you know, we're... We're managing ourselves, and we're just, uh, we put, you know, all our focus into making the record as good as we could make it, and then get it out and get some people interested. And then hopefully that turns into live dates. Well, maybe you go and uh, give John Kirby's arm a bit of a twist, seeing as he is the mayor of the cruise, so to speak. Oh, is he? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, he yeah, is indeed. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Jamie, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I uh, uh, wish you the best of luck with this album. I say, as a fan, um, I think it's fantastic. I hope other fans uh, think so too. I'm sure they will do, and I just wish you the best of success with it. Thank you, Dan. Cheers. Nice Thanks very much indeed, Jamie. Thanks, Nate. You take care. Bye-bye now. You too. Right. Goodbye.